So today, I'm going to tell you guys a story about how a toilet can save your life. I'm going to start with a picture. So where this picture is taken is at a local toilet fair in Seattle. And I think we all can recognize who this is. And so when I look at this picture, I think, you know, what is one of the richest men in the world doing spending his weekends at this toilet fair? Like, why is he, he should be on a beach in Hawaii. Like, why is he here? And why is he so interested in toilets? Well, the answer to that just might change the world. But before I get to that, I thought I'd tell you why I'm so interested in toilets. So I'm a graduate student here at UBC. And I'm in the microbiology program, and I work in Brett Finley's lab. So I came here, and I got very interested in microbes, and especially the microbes that live in your gut and on your body. So it turns out that we're actually more microbial than human. So there's more bacterial cells, 10 times more bacterial cells, living on your body than you have human cells. So you can think of ourselves as just a walking microbial ecosystem. Now, <laughs> but what are these bacteria doing? Um, so they actually have a lot of beneficial effects. And it, this is no more evident than in your gut. So these microbes in your gut can actually influence your immune system, and they also can help your metabolism. So they break down food into nutrients that you can absorb. So I got very interested in this, and this is a, an area microbiologists got a lot of attention recently, even making it to the cover of The Economist, whereas that's usually reserved for some Obama, Romney picture recently, <laughs> but it, it didn't make it to the cover. So, you know, I, I have to think, you know, what's going on here and what are all these microbes doing? And so when I started in the lab, uh, I got to thinking about, you know, what my project could be. And Brett said, well, let's, maybe let's look at how these microbes, since they influence your immune system, maybe they influence our response to vaccines. So for a lot of us, that's a bit of a stretch. But uh, we know that these microbes can influence your immune system. We also know that vaccine responses differ for each individual. And each individual has a different community of gut microbes. So maybe there's a link. So when I, I heard this, and like any good graduate student, I hit the books to try to figure out, well, how would your gut microbes affect vaccine responses? <laughs> and I came across something that struck me, and that was that vaccines don't work as well in areas of poor sanitation, mostly in developing countries. And then I looked into it further, and then I saw some studies where it said just having a toilet or not affects your vaccine response. So people who don't have a toilet have a poor response to vaccines. If you did have a toilet, you have a good response. How could this be? Like, what's the link between toilets, gut microbes, vaccines? You know, how are all these things linked together? And the more I even looked into it, I saw that toilets not only affect vaccine responses, they affect your nutrition. So they actually affect you know, your nutritional status. Now, but what's the link between all these things? Well, I think before we get into that, it's important to hear the background of toilets and the history of toilets. <laughs> so, you know, for most of us, this is the toilet as we know it. 200 years ago, when Thomas Crapper, yes, that, his name was Thomas Crapper, <laughs> and I'm not sure why that's where crap came from, I don't know the story, but so he invented the toilet, something very similar to this. So for 200 years, not much has changed. And I think that this is something that we've really taken for granted. So a lot of us, we go home to our toilet, <laughs> we do our business, we flush, and it takes care of our business, and we forget about it. But really, if you think about it, it's an amazing device. And although there have been some developments in the toilet world. You know, in Japan, they like to add technology to their toilets. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they've actually created a toilet-powered bike. So you poop in this toilet, and it makes the bike go. I'm not sure how fast it goes, <laughs> but it really does work. So we have, we, the toilet is developing, and we, and we have toilets for elephants <laughs> as well. Um, so we've created elephant toilets. There's also people that live in houses that look like toilets. So, you know, even after all these developments, 200 years, we've had a toilet, we all have toilets. For 2.6 billion people in this world, this is their toilet. And for those 2.6 billion people, that's about 40% of the world's population. Malnutrition is also a big problem. So how are these two things linked? Well, so here's a map where the, the size of the country relates to how many people have a toilet. So the bigger the country is, the more people that don't have a toilet. The smaller the country, the more people that have a toilet. So if you look at this, you don't even see the United States or Canada wiped off the map. Australia, gone. We all have toilets. 
Western Europe, not even there. But if you look at India, places of sub-Saharan Africa and South America, these are the people living today with no toilets. Now, let's pull up a map of the worldwide incidence of malnutrition. Looks very similar. But, of course, correlation doesn't mean causation. But I, I'm going to try to convince you that there is a link between these two things. There is a reason why these maps are so similar. And we all know that malnutrition is a big problem. So I think I was, if I was to poll everyone here, and I would say, if you were to give me one idea, one thing that you would do to change the world, I think many of you would say, well, let's solve world hunger. Let's feed all the hungry people in the world. Well, what you're really saying there is let's cure everyone who's malnourished. So, you know, we all appreciate this is a big problem. And one-fifth of all deaths in children under five years of age are attributable to malnutrition. And even the people who don't die of malnutrition, they also become growth stunted, and this impairs their cognitive development. So this is a big problem, but it's not a problem of awareness. There's all kinds of aid companies you know, working on this, so why is it still such a big issue? I think it's appropriate to quote Bill Gates here. So Bill Gates said, the barrier to change is not too little caring. It's too much complexity. So I think this sums up the problem of worldwide malnutrition nicely. You know, it's not a lack of empathy why this is still happening. It's just the problem of malnutrition is too complex for us to think of how we could help. Um, and it all starts without having a toilet. So it turns out that malnutrition isn't only a problem of, of diet. So if you took every single person in the world who was malnourished and fed them a proper diet, only 33% of the time they would become properly nourished. For the other two-thirds of the time, it doesn't work. So dietary intervention will not be the solution to cure worldwide malnutrition. The biggest problem turns out to be fecal contamination and sanitation. So for these people who don't have a toilet, and I call this the trickle-down effect. So you have no, no toilet, and you can imagine if you don't have a toilet, you have, you know, you've you got a hole in the ground, and there's just people defecating there, and, and this causes you know, fecal contamination of your environment. So there's no toilet to flush it away. So there's feces everywhere. And, and you know, in some of these slums, they actually have to pay to use a toilet. They have public toilets, and so you have all this feces lying around. And this is especially in children, where this is a big problem. You know, kids always put things in their mouth. So you have all these, this feces around, it leaks into the water, it gets into your food, and that will inevitably lead to increased ingestion of feces. Kind of gross. But, so this feces is actually, as I said before, full of bacteria. So there's trillions and trillions of bacteria in your feces. So if you increase your ingestion of feces, and most of the bacteria that live in your gut are good for you, but there are some harmful bacteria that if you do ingest them, they could colonize in your intestine, and this could have harmful effects. So for these children living in developing countries, they have all this fecal ingestion, and they have a colonization of bacteria that are potentially harmful. That leads to a disorder called environmental enteropathy. Now, how many of you here, put up your hand if you've heard of environmental enteropathy? Not too many, but <laughs> so it's, it's actually 70% of children living in developing countries have conditions related to this disorder. And so let's break it down. It sounds like a sciencey word, but what enteropathy really means is a disease of the intestine. I think a lot of you are familiar with celiac disease. The scientific word for that is gluten sensitive enteropathy. So it's a disease of the intestine triggered by gluten. Now, environmental enteropathy is very similar. It's a disease of the intestine triggered by your environment. And in this case, your environment is high levels of fecal contamination. So, you know, this is, this is actually now thought to be a major problem for malnutrition and vaccine failure. But if it's such a big problem, why have we never heard of it? Well, we, we have heard of it since the 1960s when the United States started sending people away in the Peace Corps. And so they sent people to some of these countries that had poor sanitation, maybe no toilets, and they came back with this weird intestinal disease. And, but when they came back to an area of proper sanitation, the disease reversed and it went away. 
So in adults, this disorder is reversible. But in children raised in these areas where there's high fecal ingestion, where there's no toilet, the imprint, it imprints for a lifetime. So because it's such an important point of their growth and development, that the effects of this disorder are irreversible. So, and, and again, like, what's happening here? Like, why is, why is this such a big problem? So, and it, it leads to increased childhood mortality, growth stunting, and impaired cognitive development. Well, there's a lot of unanswered questions, and there are a lot of clinical trials trying to figure out what's happening here. And the main thing is, what are the mechanisms that cause environmental enteropathy? So we know that it happens in these environments with high level of fecal contamination, but what exactly is happening? So that's where my research comes in, and I think, like many of you are a bit perplexed, is if this is such a big problem in you know, worldwide malnutrition, you know, how do we not know what's going on here? Well, the reason, one of the reasons is, I think, is that this disease is very hard to study in humans. It's a disease of the small intestine. And to study the small intestine in humans, it requires a biopsy, which is very invasive and not often done in children. So I set out to try to model this disease in the lab. And I think if you marry an experimental model along with the clinical trials, you can narrow in on what exactly is happening and what are the mechanisms, mechanisms that cause this disorder. So what is this disorder? Well, it's really a disorder of malabsorption. So it doesn't matter what nutrients you ingest if you can't absorb them. And most of the absorption happens in the small intestine. So I, I have a personal theory of what's happening. And that's that normally in our upper small intestine, there's not very many, very many bacteria. And the ones that are there are actually beneficial and help us break down nutrients so we can absorb them. But in, if you have no toilet, in these areas of high sanitation, you have a colonization of harmful bacteria. So you have all these bacteria you're ingesting, and there's colonizing the intestine. So now there's all kinds of bacteria there, and some of these are harmful. So imagine you're an intestinal cell. You have to make a choice. You have to choose whether to elicit an immune response to protect yourself against these bacteria, or you have to choose whether to do metabolism and uptake nutrients. What I think is that there's an overgrowth of these fecal bacteria for people who live in these environments, and that's causing the malabsorption. And it does show that in a lot of these children that have this disorder, they have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. They have too many bacteria in their small intestine, and that's causing malabsorption. So here's a picture here of uh, the small intestine. So the small intestine in humans is actually not flat. It actually has these little protrusions called villi. And what they do is they actually help us absorb nutrients. So they give it more surface area so we can absorb more nutrients. So in a healthy patient, you can see here, they have long villi and it helps with absorption. But in this disorder, it blunts the villi. So there's less absorption of nutrients. And this is why I think dietary interventions fail for children who are malnourished. Because it doesn't matter what you ingest if you can't absorb it. Let's go back to the photo here. So what, what's, what's Bill Gates doing here? Well, what he's doing is he's trying to reinvent the toilet, make one that's cost-effective and able to be used in these countries that don't have running water. So he set out this grand challenge, and he challenged people around the world to make a toilet that could actually be used in developing countries. And the winner of this was this toilet, which is from a team at Caltech. And it's a solar-powered toilet, and it runs on solar energy. It doesn't need running water, and it also converts the fecal energy, uh, fecal matter, <laughs> into energy. So these are the solutions we might need, because the thing about environmental enteropathy is it's completely, completely, if you, don't, if you do have a toilet, then, there's, then that's the reason we haven't heard of it, because we all have toilets. So none of us have environmental enteropathy. But if you don't have a toilet, then it becomes a big problem. So I think to solve issues like worldwide malnutrition, we try to think of a simple intervention that we could do to try to change the world, one thing. And I'm gonna suggest one thing to do is to give everyone a toilet. 
So let's, let's think of a few things. Let's go over a few things here. Is that let's think of malnutrition as an issue of sanitation rather than just a dietary one. And let's try to think of the implications of environmental enteropathy and maybe how simple interventions like giving everyone a toilet could help solve what's a complex problem, which is worldwide malnutrition. So my one big idea is if we give everyone in the world access to a toilet, it could save their life. Thanks.